appreciate you being aboard on Birds 365, a football Friday. Jody McDonald, John McMullen, joined by Mike Sielski, lead sports columnist from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mike, uh, and uh, if I need to apologize, I'll apologize for my contribution to continuing this Micah Parsons story here in <laughs> Philadelphia. Um, did we all drop the ball and just let Micah Parsons dictate to us? That we should be talking about something other than the Chicago Bears. Uh, like I said, if I need to apologize, I, apologize. I got sucked in. Did you? I did not get sucked in, Jody. Good for and, you, and, and, and I'm this, proud of you. <laughs> this to me speaks. I'm actually writing a column about this right now that's going to go on inquire.com Saturday morning. This to me speaks to the big problem with the 2022 Philadelphia Eagles. Really? They are boring. They are boring. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. they're twelve and one. Too good. Too but good. you know, I, I need a wide receiver doing sit-ups in the driveway here. I need conflict between former best buddies Jalen Hurts and AJ Brown. I need the offensive lineman recording a death metal album and not a Christmas album. I need something to get a little bit interested in because right now this team is kind of too good to get worked up about yeah that's how i am i can't get worked up about this stuff i get more worked up about people who get worked up about it i'm 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 amazed at how many people care about what chris sims thinks how many people care about what michael parsons thinks and by the way i i told jody cowboys fans are probably upset at poor micah because he talks so glowingly about the eagles as a whole about how great the offensive line is and his buddy Miles Sanders and the receivers. Did everybody miss that part? This is a this is a member of the Dallas Cowboys. John, this this was the softest trash talk I've ever heard. Like it, it wasn't like he was saying that Jalen was a bad quarterback. He was basically saying that he's good, but everything around him is so much better that it's hard to give him credit for yeah. the team being 12 and 1. This is not a hey, guys, Carson Wentz can't play and your team was dumb for drafting him or anything along those lines. It just was, you know, but this is what we're reaching for. Like you said, we've got to find these morsels of somebody who, uh, you know, from somebody who says something other than the Eagles are the greatest team in the history of teams and Jalen Hurts is the greatest quarterback uh, since leather was invented. (laughs) And to no one's surprise, Jalen Hurts said when asked about it, we're playing the Bears this week. Can we talk about the Bears? Let's get to the Bears. We got to kind of focus on the Bears. The Bears are our opponent this week, not yet the Dallas Cowboys. And nobody should be surprised by that because he is uh, in the short time, relatively short, uh, two years now, year and change, shown f- more narrow focus and ability to stay in his lane and on task than maybe any quarterback the Philadelphia Eagles have ever had. You've been here for a while. I've been here for a while. John's been here for a while. Certainly any during our time. No one can compare to this guy with being on task for what his job is, and that's continually win football games, which he's done this year 11 out of 12 times. Yeah, I think you're right, Jody. Um, And I was thinking about this the other day, about kind of um, the moment in time that we're in and Jalen's age. You know, Carson was guarded, right? Um, But you could chalk that up to him being a guy who had grown up in North Dakota and then now was in a a big market in Philadelphia. So maybe he wasn't certain how to handle the media and things like that. I think Jalen is a different case in that not only did he go to Alabama, which, you know, probably got as much scrutiny on a day to day basis as the Eagles do, certainly nationally and certainly within its fan base and its media market. um, But he's also what? 24 years old, you know, he's, he's come up in a time when it is customary for an athlete to guard his or her image in the age of Twitter and social media and all these kinds of things the, you know, millennials, if you want to call them that, or I, I don't know what you, what the name of the generation is, are much more protective of that. They don't come in with any expectation in, in the way that say Donovan McNabb or Nick Foles did of hey, I have to talk to these reporters and these media members who aren't connected to the team directly and who don't aren't trying to help me win the game or succeed. They're just here to ask me questions, whatever those questions might be. 
you know, Jalen is very sensitive to that and very protective of that. There's a reason he calls us rat poison. It's, you know, he came up in the Nick Saban sort of way of thinking of keep your guard up at all times. And I think that that goes a long way to explaining why he interacts with us in the way that he does. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's all Nick Saban. It's all rat poison. And the Eagles are, are very good at it. And, and I do give them credit. Um, and you know better than most, Mike. Uh, you can't control other people's perceptions, I always say. So, you know, I think it's very smart to, to, to use the Nick Saban sort of template and try to keep things in-house as much as possible. It's not fun for us, but I think it's smart. Uh, Jordan Mailata got asked about the stuff this week, and he said, gave a little left word and say, I don't even know who Dallas is up and playing, but uh, maybe they should focus on that. I asked Miles yesterday. It's like the same thing. He smiled at me because he's, you know, he's Micah's buddy. Smiled at me and said, who are they playing? And I said, Jacksonville. <laughs> maybe they should worry about Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Does this all stem from Nick Sirianni? Does he have all these guys on the same page? Or is it just sort of innate, innate that this team knows? Let's keep I it in-house. I think it's a combination of both things, John. I think, you know, the leadership in the locker room is obvious. You have guys like Jason Kelsey and Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox who have been through all this before. They've seen what works. They know how to um, be playful in and with the media in a way that doesn't um, generate the kind of headlines that a team doesn't want to have. You know, for instance, I know you saw this on Twitter yesterday. Jason did his podcast with his brother, Travis. Tremendous, and, Tremendous and, tweet. And, Right. And, and they were talking about Nick Foles and how he should, you know, the, the, the trophy for the Super Bowl MVP should be after Nick Foles. And, you know, people can look into why they said that. And it's hilarious and it's funny. <laughs> and it's the kind of thing that doesn't tick anybody off on any other teams. And, you know, I, I think I think we can overstate sometimes how much a coach sets the culture for a team. I think. Uh, more often than not, it does come down to the leadership within that locker room, the captains of the locker room, so to speak. And when you have people like Kelsey and Graham and Hertz to a lesser degree, just because he's young and hasn't been around as much, those guys are the tone setters. And, and those guys are going to make it clear that, hey, we don't do that kind of stuff here. Um, you know, we, we keep our, our, our eyes on the prize, so to speak, uh, except for Mylotta, who I think his, his streak of giving interviews in which he drops an F-bomb is now approaching Joe DiMaggio levels. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's really keeping on that yeah, really well. Yeah, but when you say, when you drop the F-bomb and it's followed by mate, it just feels Yeah, that's true. Soft. It softens the blow, yeah. 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 All right, speaking of softening the blow, how bad is the blow going to be on the Bears this week? Because, Mike, I'll be honest with you, over the last couple of days, I've been thinking, you know, the Eagles better be careful. This has got trap game written all over it. You know the Bears are bad. The Eagles know the Bears are bad. Everybody knows the Bears are bad. They've got the Cowboys in 10 days. They better be careful that it's an NFL team going out there. A not good NFL team, but an NFL team just the same. And then all this off-the-field stuff becomes a topic of conversation and gets the Eagles to narrow focus and stay tuned and being able to point to the Cowboys, like shut up, uh, worry about the Jaguars. Yeah. Uh, they're going to crush the Bears on Sunday, are they not? I think they are, Jody, and I think it's to their advantage that the following game is in Dallas against the Cowboys. I think that helps um, because if they lose to the Bears, suddenly that Christmas Eve game takes on a, a, a really outsized importance because then all of a sudden – the, the possibility of them falling behind, behind the Cowboys or losing the division lead becomes real, becomes mm -hmm. really real. Uh, so I have to think that Sirianni and the veterans in the locker room are spreading the word that, look, guys, we can't slip up this week. We shouldn't slip up this week. This team has the worst passing offense in the NFL. It has one of the worst passing defenses in the NFL. There's no reason we shouldn't go in here and take care of business Get your minds right. Get your preparation right. And let's make sure we're 13 and one heading to AT&T Stadium on Christmas Eve because, you know, the Cowboys are close enough and hold enough tiebreakers that if the Eagles do slip up, you know, all of a sudden we're going to have a real discussion here about meaningful regular season games. Yeah. 
Do you think that helps that Dallas is there in the rearview mirror? Uh, because this is the trappiest of all trappy games, Mike. I mean, this is this is it. Um, but I've been looking for these games all year. I thought Tennessee was a trap game. They came up banged up. I bought my own hype. I thought that was going to be a close game, and they just you weren't the only one, John. Yeah, and they just destroyed them. I've been incredibly impressed with this team's ability to to handle things like that, and this will be another test, but. You know, you've been around uh, Philadelphia for a long time. Is this the best Eagles team you've ever seen? It's pretty damn close, man. Um, like I said, the, the the fact that it's boring speaks to how good it is. Yep. I mean, you know, go back to 2017. Doubts started to creep in <clears throat> once Wentz got yeah. injured. Oh, yeah. You know, major doubts. I mean, I thought they were done for. Oh, I really did. Everybody did. Yeah. It was like um, a wake at the yeah. Delbert Camp Complex. The it next it day. was. You know, yeah. go back to 2004. Terrell Owens gets hurt against the Cowboys. And you think, oh, boy, you know, there's there was trepidation heading into the postseason because mm. – of the, the the previous three years of history of them losing in the NFC championship game. And yeah, the gap between then and, and the rest of the conference is wide, but you know, how much does losing TO close it? Um, th this year doesn't have that. It, it's just been kind of, this is what we do. We, we show up on Sunday and we kick your butts and we go to the next Sunday and everybody gets along and the big off season acquisitions uh, aren't making any waves. It, it isn't as if AJ Brown and Hassan Reddick and the other guys who they brought in have had to adjust or have um, th there's been any rifts or controversies or anything like that. I mean, it's it's just been so smooth. Now you can look at that and say, okay, in Philadelphia, we're always looking to the sky for the anvil that's going to fall on our heads, like in the Looney Tunes cartoon. Yeah. And so maybe something is coming, but. It, it, there's no indication that it's presented itself so far and kind of the, the cold efficiency with which this team goes out there and just beats whoever is in front of them. It, it it's, it's hard to argue that this isn't the best team I've seen. Mike, in the spirit of uh, political correctness and overly attentiveness and uh, getting our feathers in an uproar too quickly, AKA Michael Parsons disrespecting Jalen Hurts. Um, I said yesterday on the show, I think we need to change the term garbage time because it's just flat out disrespectful to the players who are actually playing in that time. <laughs> and Eagles two weeks in a row have been able to put forth what most people see as garbage time uh, for some of their young and up and coming players. I decided we needed to go with a uh, different name like, um, shoot, what the hell did I call it yesterday? designated growth snaps rather than garbage time called them designated growth snaps for the young guys for uh nicobe dean and zach mack and uh josh job and alike how many designated growth snaps are the eagles reserves going to get to play because they're so far ahead of the bears well look jody i mean I would think probably half of the fourth quarter we're looking at, right? I mean, that's what they basically got last week uh, against the Giants. Uh, and those are those are good things. That's that's a good thing, you know, to make sure that those guys are getting some work, getting some action. It doesn't hurt to have Gardner Minshew taking a few snaps here and there just to stay a little bit sharp. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will matter in the end. It doesn't necessarily mean – that if something were to happen, God forbid, to Jalen Hurts or another important player, that the guy behind him wouldn't be able to step in anyway. You know, we saw that, for instance, in 2017. Nick Foles didn't get a lot of work before Carson Wentz tore his knee up. And, you know, by the, by the midpoint of the NFC Championship game, it was like, holy God, the Eagles had the best quarterback in the league, and he was sitting on the bench the entire time behind the second best quarterback in the yeah. league. So... Um, <laughs> You know, it's a the, good thing. The winner of the Tallywhacker Trophy. There you go. The winner of the Tallywhacker Trophy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so were you uh, just the Eagles don't look ahead, but we can look ahead. If they finish thing, this thing off, uh, if they're the number one seed and the road to the Super Bowl goes through Lincoln Financial Field, where are you in the rest versus rust argument? Do you sit, guys? Do you sit? Now, I think people, I mentioned on the show, I think people forget, you know, 
they say preseason environment. You don't have 90 players. You don't have 85 players. You only have 53. And last year, people go back to last year in the Dallas game, and they clinched the playoffs, And but they still have the COVID rules. So if you remember, they put about yeah. a dozen players on the COVID list. You can't do that anymore. So some guys have to play. Um, but you can sit key players. Um, you have a bye, though. And you start thinking, well, if you're not playing against New Orleans, if you're not playing against the Giants, then you have a week off. Rest versus Russ, my seals, Mike Sealski. I've seen rest work enough, John, that I think you go with rest. Uh, it worked in 2004 when the Eagles were 13 and one, and Andy Reid basically sat all his starters. Uh, the final two games, one in St. Louis against a bad Rams team, and then the end of the season against the Bengals. They had a bye week. They came out. They looked fine. Uh, you saw the same thing in 2017, basically, you know, rested all the starters in that final game against the Cowboys. We saw uh, the the nascent greatness of Nate Sudfeld in that Cowboys game. Yeah, just ask Jeffrey Lurie. Yeah, just ask Jeffrey Lurie about that uh, and his fond memories of the unstoppable Nate Sudfeld. Uh, and they came out and, and played pretty well against the Falcons. I think especially now, John, with the, the regular season being 17 games, you take an opportunity to rest guys if you can and get them fresh. Uh, and look, is it possible that a team that rests its starters will come out and look rusty uh, during the course of its first playoff game back? And do you take that chance? Yeah, I suppose you do. Uh, but remember too, that the, the trend and the ethos now in the NFL is to get those practice reps in. Remember back in the preseason, we heard Nick talking about how, the reps that the starters and players were getting in practice, mental reps, physical reps, film study time was every bit as important as actually having them play in the preseason games themselves. And I think the same principle would probably apply late in the season. If you're staying sharp at practice and in the film room, then you can afford to sit out, you know, three quarters of the regular season finale. I'm glad you added in the film room because Let's yeah, be honest, rights, the Eagles yeah. don't exactly bust it in practice. So <laughs> those reps that Sirianni may be relating to are not comparable to what most teams do or used to do around the National Football League. And I'll play devil's advocate a little bit for you. Yeah, they went all JV squad last year. How'd that work <laughs> out going down to Tampa for the playoff game? Rather than go back to 2004 or other years, let, let's go to the most recent example, which was last year. It was 31 to nothing before you blinked. And yes, Tampa was better than they were. And everyone should have acknowledged that ahead of time, which not all legal fans did. Some of them actually said, bring on Brady, which was stupid. Um, but they, they played Tampa much tougher earlier in the season when they weren't playing well. They played him at the end of the season when they had actually gotten a turnaround and were playing well and got abused. Do you not factor that into your thinking? Nope. Not at all. First of all, they didn't play Tampa that well the first time around. <laughs> Tampa got out to a three touchdown lead and, you know, slept walk through the second half of that game. Um, Jody, secondly, three, three touchdown lead is not as great as a 31 to nothing. Lead. <laughs> now we're really splitting hairs. Um, the other thing, too, more than splitting hairs. Yeah. The, the, the other thing, too, Jody, is that. I would argue that the Eagles last season and the Steelers last season, who were the two seventh seeds in yeah. the playoffs, were not really playoff teams. They were not. I mean, they both got their doors blown off uh, by the, their respective teams that they were playing. Uh, the Steelers by the Chiefs, I think it was, and uh, maybe may the Chiefs, I forget. Anyway, um, the point being that the gap between – that iteration of the Eagles and that iteration of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was so wide that, you know, Nick Sirianni could have played all his starters in that final week against the Cowboys and it wouldn't have mattered. They could be as, they could have been as sharp as they needed to be. Jalen Hurts was not equipped to win that postseason game. That team was not equipped to <laughs> wasn't win that postseason either. game. Yeah, yeah he wasn't, he had, yeah. a, you know, the ankle thing, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think we're talking apples and oranges here. Yeah. Um, I agree with that, that part of it. Yeah. They just weren't ready. And you know, the NFL, that's one of the things, one of the most impressive parts about Jalen Hurts is the leap he took from the off season and the things he did. We always talk about his work ethic. Um, but, uh, it, from, from the standpoint of the organization, you mentioned Jeffrey Lurie, they do some goofy things. He calls Nate Sudfeld unstoppable. Um, 
we know Howie Roseman, the, the sort of uh, ebbs and flows. It's like an EKG. He's the greatest GM in the history of the world. Everybody wants him out. Um, but this organization, Mike, is over the Jeffrey Lurie ownership era is arguably right there with whether you want to talk about New England, Green Bay as the standard. But here's the difference. <clears throat> New England had Tom Brady. Uh, Green Bay had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. The Eagles have done this, different coaches, different quarterbacks, consistent playoff appearances, runs. People will say only one Super Bowl, which I hate, but nonetheless, they're in a position to make a run at another. You're around the Phillies, you're around the Sixers, you're around the Flyers. This organization, how important is that to the success of this team? Oh, it matters a ton, John. And I think you have two prime examples that are very similar that speak to what you're getting at. The year they went to the Super Bowl, most recently, 2017. What had they done two years earlier? They were in major crisis mode. They fired Chip mm -hmm. Kelly. They, you know, Jeffrey Lurie had rubble at his feet. And within two years, they were hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. Think back two years ago from right now. It was 2020. Carson Wentz was making it clear the Eagles were going to have to trade him. And we were all kind of in this mode of like, they're not really going to trade him, are they? And then it inched along to the point where it was like, yeah, they're going to have to trade him. This guy who they just signed to a four-year, $128 million extension, they're going to have to move him because he doesn't want to play here anymore. And look at the, the – and they brought this chaos on themselves by drafting Jalen Hurts and misreading how Carson Wentz would react to that. And here we are two years later, and they're 12-1 and one, and a favorite to get to the Super Bowl and win it. So I think that speaks to what you're saying about their ability to kind of – steer the ocean liner out of the way of the iceberg in a way that most organizations, both in the NFL and locally, have not been able to do. You referenced the Sixers and the Flyers. I mean, my God, the Flyers haven't been able to adjust to the salary cap era of the National Hockey League since the league instituted the salary cap yeah, in 2005. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Sixers had a golden opportunity with Sam Hankey initiating the process to build themselves into perennially a team that can that can compete for a championship every year, and they're still short of that. You know, they're they're much better than they were, uh, and they win fifty games every year, and they have Joel Embiid, but they still manage to fall short. So, yeah, I think the Eagles deserve a ton of credit for what they've done. Uh, it's easy for us to be locked into the nearsightedness of Philadelphia of you know just us fixating on the Eagles, but sometimes you need to take a step back and compare the Eagles to other organizations around the yeah. NFL, and you realize how successful they are, relatively speaking. And, oh, by the way, uh, just to add to the organizational praise and one individual in particular, that would be the owner, at least according to John. And I trust him on this, and he's got his sources. Josh McDaniels was almost the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. If Jeff Laurie hadn't said, no, Howie, I don't think we're going to go in that direction. Yeah, I don't think we'd be talking about a 12 and one football team. If jo Jody, the coach. consider this, consider this. Imagine the 2022 Philadelphia Eagles with Josh McDaniels, McDaniels as their head coach and Russell Wilson as their starting quarterback. Yeah. yeah. And JG might... would still be here. JG was very close. When you heard about all the Jonathan Gannon stuff, the Eagles were going to hire Jonathan Gannon before they were going to hire Nick Sirianni. That's because they were going to hire Josh McDaniels, and those two are so close. So, yep. uh, yeah, it's it, you go back to Doug Peterson season as well. The Eagles wanted Adam Gase, and he had too many demands coming off Chip Kelly, as you mentioned, Mike. And they were like, uh, we can't give you all this, and they kind of dodged a bullet there. Ben McAdoo famously was on his way down the Jersey Turnpike. They had a welcome bouquet, <laughs> welcome basket there yeah. with muffins. And they got Doug Peterson because the Giants convinced Ben McAdoo to come back. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. I just, yep. I, the organization is great, but sometimes you need a little bit of luck. Yeah, maybe it's better. Maybe they should, if, if and when Sirianni, you know, leaves or gets fired or something happens, 
maybe they should just go into the process saying, okay, whoever our first choice is, <laughs> disregard him and go with our third or fourth guy because that seems to work for them. All right, Mike Sielski, I need to confirm this from you right here, right now. Are you rooting for the Dallas Cowboys this week? Because if the Cowboys lose and Eagles win, talk about the Eagles being boring. That would just take the yeah. edge off the matchup coming up between the Eagles and the Cup. So are you going to be watching rooting against Doug Peterson on Sunday? I want yes, I want something, Jody. I, I want I want Miles Sanders to start fumbling again. Ooh, I mean, this is ooh, this is what we're talking ooh. about here. That's Mike Steelski, fans. I, I, look, all I'm saying is I, I'm tongue I'm being tongue right. in cheek here, right. but you guys get what I'm saying. Yes. Like even Miles Sanders used to put the ball on the ground three or four times a season. He hasn't fumbled once. I mean, I remember the good old days of Ryan Matthews. That dude couldn't walk across the the cafeteria yeah. at the Novacare complex without spilling his avocado rice bowl all over the place. Nice. You know, I mean, it was like it was it. that bad. Um, so. You know, I just want something, something to pique our interest and create some drama. Remember Matt Jones, who was here for, I don't know, a couple of weeks? Yeah. Um, it, it, I remember being in the locker room with Matt, and he went on this dissertation about the eagle claw, which is one of the <laughs> ball security techniques. The Eagles have it still up in, in their facility with, with some of the signs. And Matt's talking about this, and then he goes out there, fumbles first game. Boom. Uh, all this ball security talk. Uh, Eagles rep it. You know, even Nick today, we rep it. We're better than I, – I use that term luck, Mike. You know, coaches hate to hear that, um, and I get why. But the stars do have to align at some point. And you talk about Miles Sanders, and I'll bring it back to Jalen Hurts uh, again. He's thrown three interceptions. Who saw that coming? No, nobody did. And uh, to your point, though, John, I would say that with with Hertz, it's less about luck because I keep thinking back over the season. And maybe there's one or two plays that stands out that stand out in your guys memory. But I have a hard time mm -hmm. remembering any plays, any throws that Jalen has made where you go, oh, that was risky. He shouldn't have done that. He really put the ball in a, you know, in a tenuous situation there. He just doesn't do it. He doesn't do dumb yeah. stuff. And that's half yeah. the battle when it comes to winning games in this league. Yeah. All right, Mike, I uh, want to get you on the record about uh, the Eagles and one specific individual having an effect on the rest of the National Football League going forward. This whole Micah Parsons, uh, Sims uh, putting his MVP status in question uh, it should be just background noise. The one thing you can absolutely positively say about Jalen Hurts is he's the most improved quarterback in the National Football League, not even close. Orlovsky went so far as to compare him to Drew Brees. People get yeah. their nose out of joint because he gets compared to Brock Purdy and to uh, uh, their own backup, Gardner Minshew. He was also compared to Drew Brees this week. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. If I'm Jalen Hurts, I kind of like that, that someone compared me to the <clears> Drew Brees. He's the most improved quarterback in the NFL by far. And Orlovsky went as far to say he's, he's the most improved quarterback he's ever seen on a year-to-year -year basis. And we all believe it's because of Jalen Hurts that he put in the time and effort, that he's a guy. Sirianni this week talking about anytime you show up at the Eagle facility, Jalen Hurts is there. Two o'clock in the morning, Jalen Hurts is there. He never leaves. He's there all the time because he's so dedicated and so motivated to become the best player that he possibly can. Will that be the mantra of other quarterbacks in the NFL this offseason? That if if you put in the time and effort, you really do get to cash the check. You get to pay dividends with it. Will Jalen Hurts ha have that kind of effect with the improved level of his play on the rest of the National Football League going forward? I think he'll have a different effect, Jody. I, I don't know if he'll inspire other young quarterbacks to, to buckle down and work hard and, you know, I, I don't know if, he, if Zach Wilson, for instance, is going to look at Jalen Hurts and say, boy, if I really put my nose to the grindstone, um, I, I'll become a, the quarterback that I think I already am, <laughs> you know, in the case of Zach Wilson. Um, but I, I think there's a different twist on this. I think what it's going to do is cause teams and decision makers, general managers, coaches to hold out longer for the possibility that a quarterback who isn't playing great in his first or second season in the league might get it 
in his third or fourth, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. t- teams are under such pressure because they want to win within the window of a quarterback's rookie contract. They're under such pressure to make a quick decision about a guy, right? We drafted Mitch, Tr- we, we drafted Mitch Trubisky. We have to know whether he is the guy or not. And if he shows any signs that he isn't, we got to cut bait with him before we sign him to this contract that's going to be ridiculous. I think what Jalen does is cause teams to say, hey, wait a minute, we might have to give this guy just another year because maybe then the leap is coming. And and Jalen isn't the only quarterback who's done this. Look at Josh Allen in Buffalo, right? That guy was spraying passes all over Orchard Park for two years. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, he's one of the two or three best quarterbacks in the league and is making throws that nobody else can make. So um, I think that's the after effect of what happened here with Hurts. Uh, yeah, I, I would like, I go back to organizations though, Mike, I, I think you're right. I think that's how people should look at it. Um, but I don't think there's enough patience in most of these organizations and there's so much pressure. You bring up, uh, Mitch Trubisky in Chicago this week, uh, Eagles obviously facing the bears. That is a really, really rabid football market. Typically, um, People have a difficult time being patient when all that pressure is on them. And again, I I point back to Jeffrey Lurie. But last one from me, Mike, at MikeSielskiInquire.com, WIP. Listen to him there on the weekends with Glenn Mack now. Listen to Jody on the weekends with Glenn Mack now. Um, You mentioned Miles Sanders. Uh, If he is going to have that fumble in a bit, I'll get you in trouble. I want to hold you accountable. (laughs) Like Jalen, I knew I shouldn't have said that. You can't, like you can't, yeah, you, you can't joke about Philadelphia sports. No, it's I like know, doing hand know. grenades. You can't I do know. it. You can't do it. If there is going to be an upset, if there is going to be a disappointment before the Super Bowl, what team is going to upset the Eagles? Oh, the obvious one, San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, I mean, look, you can all see it. We can all see it. Kyle yeah. Shanahan's a really good coach. That team has. All the makings, all the elements in place. Uh, you know, it's got an unknown at quarterback right now, but it seems like Shanahan kind of d- doesn't mind that. You know, he he wants a certain kind of guy, and he hasn't quite gotten them yet because Trey Lance hasn't been healthy and hasn't developed yet. But um, that that's the team, and it's the obvious one. But it's it's the true one. I mean. That team can win any number of ways. It went into Green Bay in last year's playoffs and won a game without scoring an offensive touchdown. True. It probably should have beaten the Rams yeah. in the Boston championship Charlotte. game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it probably should have won that Super Bowl two or three years ago oh, against yeah. the they Chiefs. They outplayed Kansas City. They, they, they beat them up and down the field. Yeah. So uh, that would be the team that, if I were an Eagles fan, would give me the Willies. All right, last one for me. Could you pick Ian Book out of a lineup? Yeah. Who? Ian Book. No, I could not. I haven't seen him in the locker room lately either. Um, so, you know, no. To answer your question, Jody, no. Um, Ian's always in the locker room. You're just in the back, Mike. With the I'm, t- I'm hanging out. I'm talking yeah, Christmas cool albums kids. with Kelsey yeah. and my exactly. lot. Yeah. Uh, we all go to the you. back. <laughs> just the cool kids are in the back. Yeah. That's right, man. That's yeah, right. I bring it up because uh, according to uh, uh, Chris Sims, if uh, uh, Jalen were going to go down. Gardner could step right in and play. But then Gardner could go down, and before you know it, the Eagles' hopes and dreams are pinned to Ian Book. He's so I think Brock I got to learn what he looks like, because I couldn't pick him out of the lineup. I'm glad to hear I have company. Now, look, Jody, I mean, it's it's nice to bat around ideas like that and what-ifs and all that, but you know, when was the last time it's a team... not all ne- that what if, Mike. Brock Purdy is leading the 49ers to victory. They're down to their third string, guys, so shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're late enough in the season where, it, you know, that, that, that took Trey Lance getting hurt week one or week two and Garoppolo getting hurt in week, week whatever, 14 or 15, uh, you know... It, I don't think we're going to see a repeat of 2002 where everybody was like, AJ Feely. Oh my God. But you know, I, I've been wrong before. Like I said, I thought they were dead meat when Wentz went down in Los Angeles. We and, all uh, did. We yeah. all did. The Eagles did. The Eagles they thought did. they were done. They, yeah. they thought they were. Cool. That truly, that, that moment truly showed that was, that was, and look, I get the love for Nick Foles, 
But my goodness, the, the coaching job that Peterson and Frank Reich did in the aftermath of that. John to kind of, Yeah, John. and John, to rework the offense, um, you know, it's, it, to me, it's the most missed aspect of that entire championship oh, run. Yeah. They rebuilt the, the whole offense. They the the Falcons, the Vikings, and the Patriots yeah. had no idea what the Eagles were running offensively because they completely revamped their play calling scheme and everything to accommodate Foles, and it led to a championship. So you tell me Philly special wasn't in the playbook till Foles took over. Philly, Philly, baby. Philly, uh, Philly. I, you know, I, would they have run it in that situation with Carson Wentz? I don't know. Maybe not. You Carson would have regarded it as a slap you know, in the I, face. How can you not put the ball in my hands? Yeah. I'm the franchise guy. You know, I'm North you're, Dakota you're, tough. You, you, you're joking, obviously, Mike, but I think you're right. They wouldn't yeah. because they felt no, they, they wouldn't have needed to do it. Exactly. They, felt you, they, they had the MVP potentially a quarterback. Well, hey would would Wentz have suggested it let's remember it was Foles oh, yeah. who was the guy that's who suggested true. that yeah. play very yeah. true Mike uh we always appreciate will you come on and suggest what we should be talking about because I'm about done talking about Michael Parsons but I had to bring <laughs> it up with you too thank you very much for the insight today we will get you back on before the playoffs start appreciate it bud thanks Mike always enjoy it guys thanks be My well pleasure. Our pleasure. Mike Sielski here with us on uh, Birds 365. All right, Johnny Mac, you're exiting stage left. You're getting over to uh, get. Uh, Got to talk to the head coach. Head talk coach about gonna, how he keeps everybody on the same page away from the rat poison, Jody. You're going to get him to whisper sweet nothings in your ear off the record. Is that Hopefully. how this works? Hopefully. All right, uh, Johnny Mac, thank you much. Uh, when we come back, it'll be Tone. Tone's going to jump in, take Johnny Mac's spot. We do have a uh, uh, Bears guest coming up as well. Keep it right here on Birds 365.